They say that art is the representation of an artist's soul. Maybe that's why the acolyte is rotting. Power corrupts, and when you're in charge, you start doing things that you think are right when they're actually not. said George Lucas, 2005, in a premonition about Leslie Headland. With identical twins, it was very difficult to tell them apart. Yes, that's right. It turns out that the Acolyte is a Plagueis on both their houses. That pun is simultaneously amazing and so bad it makes you cringe that you found it funny. And even his appearance in the finale is a great explanation of this show. That the more you find out about it, the worse it gets. Like, the show is bad when you watch it, and it always turns out to be the worst way possible that you never even considered. Like, it wasn't just him hiding out in the episode, they're trying to pitch that as the reason why they should get a season two. Well, alongside thirsting over manager Kinto. Obviously. Feels good, doesn't it? To hold one in your hand again. The issue is, when manager Kinto is asked about the guy who he's literally sharing a room with on a planet, it's like, were they cave mates? Were they neighbors? Or was he unaware of his presence? And Manny says, I didn't know until the cameo came out itself. So I experienced it as an audience member. I'm going to need to talk to Leslie about this possible roommate and how the story will unfold. When we saw those episodes months ago, that bit was blacked out. And so I didn't know who it was. I'm just as baffled as you and the rest of the Star Wars fan base. But I'm curious to see what happens. This wouldn't have been a problem if someone like Yord had said it, but Manny Jacinto is meant to have been living with the guy. If Manny doesn't know the story, up, he can't act in a way that he should, knowing what is happening. And during all of those scenes, Plagueis is hiding out, spying on them from a puddle in the floor with a straw for air or something. I don't know. I don't even know where he could fit. In a cave with a pool of water in the middle. And this stuff just keeps building on top of each other. Oh, well, why was Kylo Ren's theme tune played? I have no idea. I'm gonna have to ask Leslie about that as well. How many pupils do you think he had before May and Osha? I don't know. I think it was May, but I have no idea. I don't even know when he switched from being a Jedi to a Sith. I mean, Obviously, it's not his fault. Leslie should have told him about all of these things. And I'm not even sure she knows. It really seems like it was a seat of your pants thing, especially when she said she only put him in the later half of the series because everybody started thirsting over him. So the episodes had to be rewritten to crowbarring into them. Just like the characters in the show themselves, everything just seems to have been done in the moment for what they thought felt good at the time, rather than having any kind of longitudinal principle or goal in mind. Make it make sense. Even down to the fight scenes themselves when he's talking about them, it is, how did the first duel differ with Sol from the end? And he's like, well, I was more comfortable with fighting for that one, but I also had less time. Unlike weeks to prepare for the episode fight fight scene, for this one, I had maybe a night to prepare, or I'd have to change it on the day. We just had to film it like that. We didn't have any time to prepare. We are all hands on deck. On our last legs, the writer's strike was impending. We had to move quickly. You're filming the climax of the finale and rushing it with no preparation because it was poorly planned, poorly timed, and poorly thought out. And there was really only one person to blame for that. And don't worry, Leslie Headland is just getting started. Kind of comes across like a threat, doesn't it? The funny thing is, one of her big pitches for season two is, yeah baby, Plagueis. And Inverse themselves are like, well the Acolyte has just lost its strength because now they've added Plagueis and Yoda into it. So rather than forging out on their own in a new timeline where they can do whatever they want, well now you've just tied yourself into everything else. You've limited yourself. And you did it all for a few seconds of member berries in the finale. Our view lowers to reveal the back of a head with pointy green ears and thin tufts of white hair. Congratulations. But this interview from Collider is absolutely wild. I mean, it starts with, I want to scream about the hand touching and the visuals of that. I also want to make everyone read about Oshima stuff at the end of the interview. You remember when journalists were supposed to be unbiased and principled and now they're like, oh my God, I'm fangirling. Leslie Headland was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. And it starts as creepy as it goes on. You spoke a little bit about how the stranger is an avatar for you and a character that you gravitate towards. I very much feel the same way about villains. This literally is the rise of the thirst trap villain all over again. When he takes Osha in, he's this formidable fighter, terrifying villain, but he has another side. This seductive, intentionally vulnerable, probing her. Throbbing. For her own strength in the force, pushing her to tap into emotions. See, we weren't even going to see him in episode six, but I saw him screen test in his helmet and I was like, well, there will be riots in the street if I do not end the show with him versus soul. So I rewrote the ending. <laughs> He steps forward with the sunlight accentuating his taut muscles. No wonder everything was so last minute, it was never intended. We're now rewriting scripts because of thirsty. Just have a casting couch and get it out of your system before you start like normal Hollywood. The power of Manny. <laughs> 
Maybe that's what they meant in episode three. One, two, and the power of Manny. I wish that was planned. If that turned out to be planned from the start, I take back everything I said about episode three. I would accept that for the pun. Come. It was very important that she had her own agency and they made the decision independently of him because obviously a dark Sith Lord of Evil cares about the empowerment of women. You understand what that means that the good guys have to do then, right? He's a terrifying villain, a seductive possible teacher, and then a romantic lead. And when she saw Manager Kinto on a TV show, she says, I knew exactly where his face was between your leg. I don't know. I will never forget the shot I saw with him. And so she looked at Manny, the Sith Lord, and her wife asked her, what do you want the Sith to say? Hey, how can the Sith represent you, Leslie? I want to say that people don't want me to exist as a gay woman. What? Do you live in America or the far- You have a pissing flag. I don't even have a flag. As a woman in particular in this space, you mean the one that has specifically put them at the top of the pecking order for decades because attractive ones bring in all the customers? Ah, uh, no, no, I, I- Okay, fair enough. No, I think I think we found the problem there. I am unaccepted because of who I am and because of what I believe in. I want to wield my power the way I'd like to without having to answer to the legion of people out there who exist. And she thought, a Sith Lord who murders people. That's what represents me. I think we're discovering where the season failed. I think everybody feels this way. They're all psychopathic murderers deep down. There's this feeling for female directors that they can't cry. No, it, they shouldn't. They shouldn't cry because they're adults. That's why. You should act professional and capable in your job because you're an adult, not a crybaby child. Grow up. But I'm gonna cry because this is my dream. You should have hired Cutie Gat where he was right up your street. So then she talks about how she put herself into Kamir. Throbbing. She really thought that a dark Sith Lord was right up her street and put perfectly aligned with her. Says the difficult part of Osha's story was to get the story beats to make a switch to the Sith. And it's like, yeah, it was difficult, wasn't it? That's why you didn't put any in. The only story beat was seeing Manny Jukinto's arse. And she was like, well, if that's a full moon, I guess I'm leaving the light. As he begins to untie a belted knot from around his waist, she straightens up for a better look. And then we get the most unhinged question I've, I think I've ever read. Where Osha kills Sol, so much is it conveyed because he's choking on the words. But from my impression of it, I was like, he doesn't even give her the agency to make this choice herself because he's accepting his fate. It adds insult to injury. <laughs> You've got a murderous lunatic slaughtering an innocent person in front of your eyes and you're like, I can't believe he's not just letting her. He could at least have the decency to fight. You know, make it really savage. She's not even allowed to be horrifically evil in this because he's forgiven the fact that she's joined the dark side because she wants to get her end away. You can't even let her get a satisfying kill. You're not supposed to. She's a pissing villain, you evil cow. I mean, like, seriously. <laughs> even Leslie's like, well it, well, it is the betrayal of her father. This is a story about the Sith, so that's not gonna happen. There's this thing that's called benign sexism. Luckily, no one's heard about it before because we kept them locked in the kitchen. And part of this, paternal protectionism, otherwise known as the mom is only supposed to raise infants, whereas the father raises adults. And so because the mom really lets the child get away with everything, but the father comes along to raise you for the world, he then imposes boundaries, authority. He teaches you how to act like an adult, you know, so you don't go and cry at work. That's his job. And she's like, no, you're taking away my agency because you've got dangly bits. This seems to have really affected her. And so she's decided to sympathize with evil and join the Sith. Dad issues. Dad, 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 Dad issues. Dad issues. <laughs> Basically the story about how for Leslie Headland, sparing the rod spoiled the child. Well, we're talking about fist clenching, kyber bleeding. Oh my God. I think she had a crisis midway through. This was my dream. When we talked about early in the writer's room about bleeding a lightsaber, to me, that's a very intimate thing. I talked to Pablo about it a lot. The crystal has to be exposed without getting too explicit. When he shot looking into the lightsaber, we've always seen the lightsaber as a, and then the journalist jumps into the coffee. Phallic symbol. There's the, it's a long rod, you know. Throbbing. Turns out all those audiobook descriptions, perfectly accurate description of what they intended. Pressed against him, she meets his sympathetic gaze, still throbbing right in front of his throat. That's why Screen Rant, when they wrote about it, why are all the Acolytes lightsabers? Why do they have such thick shafts on them? What does this mean for canon? They wrote a whole thing trying to work out how there's batteries in them or something that just needed more energy because they were less refined. No, no. Turns out all the women on set are a thirsty bitch. <laughs> 
That's that's what it was. That's why these ones had a very specific throb setting. Exactly. You said it, not me. Yeah, but you were about to. To look inside it. To look down it. To see its... To see its what? Dear. Look, I know you've got a wife, so this may not be your area. But what do you think people do with this? What kind of weird, freaky people are in Hollywood who are obsessed with looking inside it and down it? Would you have... Did you have, like, a mag light with you or something? Do you get, like, one of those little hospital cameras? Uh, just start shoving. I, I don't know. I don't care. Why'd you ask? That's so great, too. Because something we've discussed around The Last Jedi is how Rey walked into a moist cave. For anyone listening to this, not reading the review, that's in quotation marks. Moist cave. Stay crisp and juicy. And all of this self-discovery for Rey inside her own cave. There's a lot of imagery inherently baked into that. So Rey went into an evil version of her own genitalia, discovered all about herself, and apparently it was dank. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure how much she can learn about herself from her own bacterial swamp, but here we are. I mean, when we were doing the VFX, I was like, put veins in her hand. <laughs> I want this to be so visceral. I just think it's so personal and intimate for her to bleed on her lightsaber this way. Obviously, we're going to need to see the veins. <laughs> There's so much beauty to it. <laughs> Because this is the weapon that killed her mother. So now she's reclaiming it as her own and creating something complete. That's what everybody wants, doesn't it? You know, you've got hold of the thing which slaughtered your parents and all of your friends. And now you're like, you know what I need to do for this? Turn it into a veiny throbbing device I can use for my own entertainment. I, I, what? Get the blokes back again, seriously. And I really like the moments that when you're killing somebody as a very violent actor, you're normally met with further violence. But in this case, the stranger greets her compassionately. Yes, because they're both pissing evil. You're not supposed to be turning into a moist cave over this. Juicy. It's supposed to be horrific. You're supposed to be repulsed. And she's like, oh my god, this is so hot. The way she choked the life out of him. The reference that I used for Plagueis was Gollum in Fellowship of the Ring. I don't even believe her. That is 100% Abe's Odyssey. Oh, no. Even the music is accurate. Ow. But we really see how poorly thought things through are when somebody asked her about character motivations. For instance, Basil. I'm curious, why did Basil sabotage the ship? Yes, nobody knows. That's because it was terribly written. The show should have informed you and let you know why it was happening. You shouldn't have to go to the director as a journalist afterwards to try and get an explanation for what happened in the show. And then when you get the explanation, um, well, it doesn't make any sense. I think, not he's, not stated a fact, I'm guessing, that he's kind of, lots of hedging going on here, isn't there? I love Basil. I wanted to give him a hero moment. So I kind of just like the idea that when he saw the handcuffing, he was like, what's going on here? You think that explains why he stopped Sol murdering May, do you? Despite the fact that May is completely evil. I've got to be honest. I've seen the show. I've read the explanation. It still makes absolutely no sense. Apart from the fact that you were just like, I love Basil. I need to get him to do something. And you thought his hero moment was protecting evil. Got Sol killed, by the way, that moment. If Basil hadn't done that, Sol would still be alive. Basil killed Sol. Hero moment. I'm a uh, clinic an asshole. Nothing I can do. I gotta be honest, love. Not the best pitch for season two, but that is what all of this is building up for. We unpack season one's finale and teases her plans for season two. But with the first season of The Acolyte done, you'd think that Leslie Headland would spill some secrets. But she's still playing cards close to her chest. I think that's because she doesn't know about them. I think it is there is no plan. As we saw at the start, she already changed season one while she was making it, and she doesn't even know why Basil has done the things that he's done previously. Much like her mystery boxes, I think it's because there is isn't an answer. She's still waiting for that coveted second season order. I'm not online. But they told her an eager group of fans campaigning for another season of the show. Which is interesting that they had to tell Edland about it. Because Edland says, I'm not online. My wife told me about it. About hashtag renew the acolyte. It made me feel that people are invested and love the show. Which is great. I'm like, hang on. Your wife told you about the hashtag? Because in other places, you've been begging people to launch a social media campaign. In the Collider interview, truly any online online support and love that you can send the show is tricky because the internet works, so you have to talk about it. If you enjoyed the performance, get on social media, let them know about it. Encourage your friends to watch the show. To ignore the IMDB score. If you enjoyed it, tell people. So it's weird that your wife told you about a campaign that you told them to start in the first place. Make it make sense. And this has some interesting points, like when they're talking about getting Yoda in, and she goes, I heard you have to fight hard. Well, I wouldn't say fight hard, as in an adversary way. It wasn't fighting in an aggressive way. It was definitely a spirited conversation. That's a we 
didn't argue, we debated response. If you're talking about it in a spirited way, uh, there was definitely pushback, wasn't there? People didn't want you to have Yoda, because they knew what you'd do to Yoda. <laughs> Please, sir, don't taint our brand. And she is baiting the season two with Plagueis. A Plagueis on both their houses. He's definitely a signifier of things to come if we move forwards. If you thought people were pissed at season one, imagine how they'll pissed will be when they start destroying characters they actually like. But the tease is, there's Plagueis, and we know that Palpatine will eventually become his apprentice, and we know these two are not going to fall into that set of lineage. That means they're doomed. That's a complication. An imbalance. How will they survive the structure of how the sit- They won't. They can't. It would break can't- Not that you care about that, obviously. That was probably stupid of me to bring up. Is there a chance that they could decide just not to be Sith? Yeah, I mean, I can't talk to you about that. Is that an option? Is the rule of the Sith one master, one apprentice, and a load of people that thought, you know, I kind of want to live, you could just be over there, I'll just be, you know, a not Sith. I don't think the Sith would let you get away with that, personally. He just calls himself a, um, a sleuth. He's not a Sith, he's a sleuth, and that's an entirely different thing. I am a Soth master. They call me Dearth Stranger of the Soth. This is beginning to sound like a Spaceballs movie, to be honest. Where did they come from? Where did you go? Where did you come from? Cotton I do. They've brainwashed you. Is there anything that you're dying to explore in a season two? You seen how the entire interview is going, Are you gonna get a season two? Talk about season two! Gone are all the honest reviews. Now everybody is just begging, please can you give us the view wonder that would be a season two? Please, oh mighty Leslie, let me mine the algorithm one more time. <laughs> if that's how I feel, I get the feeling that's how these journalists feel as well. Their articles will have been popping off too, you know. The only difference is, they have to pretend they liked it, if they want to get those interviews anyway. I'm I'm really excited about the prospect of a May Venestra relationship. I love the idea that Venestra now has got her hands on a force sensitive, powerful woman. One who would be docile enough for Venestra to educate and become an allegiance with. That was so very exciting to set up for your wife. This all seems really creepy, especially knowing Leslie Headland's background. And now you've got your wife involved, who both claim to be aligned with the Sith, and you want to deliver into your wife's hands a docile woman that she will be able to educate and mould. You really do write what you know, don't you, Leslie? Obviously, Osha and the Stranger is probably the juiciest relationship I would love to dive into. Juicy. Osha is juicy confirmed. <laughs> I know. They need to stop. They need to stop. There's so much I would love them to explore internally, and not just the hand-holding. <laughs> they need to explore each other's lightsabers, probably so they can look into them, because it, it, that's really, um, well, that's really intimate for some reason that no one's quite worked out yet. Seriously, Leslie, do you not know what people do with them? I, like, I would love to see her with a lightsaber. Yeah, come here. I would love to explore that, especially when she found the throbbing setting. How do you feel about the hashtag Renew the Acolyte, which I did indeed tweet out myself? Did you know? It just warmed my heart. It made me feel so good. Glad I could be of service, Leslie. I really do. In my own small way. Much like Manny Jokinto's lightsaber. Wait, hang on. If Manny Jokinto's lightsaber is basically just, well, you know, it's true. It's phallic. Then what does that say about Manny Jokinto's lightsaber? Does Manny just have, like, one big one, and then when he needs to, he can pop out a smaller one? <laughs> For extra jobs? <laughs> I could see why he's so popular with the ladies. Uh, but people are so invested and love the show. I'm so proud of the show. I think it's a huge accomplishment for me. What's the best compliment I could give you, Leslie? You really inspired all of the Star Wars viewers. Th they were everywhere. Not watching your show, but they did watch basically everything else on YouTube. Like, you inspired view counts across the entire internet, which are rarely seen for a piece of television of uh, this quality. That definitely was a big accomplishment for you. I was so invested in the story. I love the characters, and I love all of the boundaries that we pushed. The boundaries that we pushed with Manny's character. I think that's because they're claiming that the thirst is due to flipping classic gender tropes of hypersexualization. She's really proud of that. Remember back to the other Collider interview, where they said because he was soft-spoken and cooking, he was woman-coded. Hey, that, that was them, that wasn't me. I didn't say it, I just laughed. Alright? It's not a crime in the UK. Yet. But I do think this is a great example of what Leslie Headland is counting on in the future. It's basically more mystery box. She's like, ah, oh, Arsha and Jacinto, they're 
they're going to get their kit off. They're definitely going to jump in it. They're definitely going to be grabbing each other's lightsabers, probably peering into the end of them. You know, despite how dangerous that is, it's really intimate, you see. We're going to hold them against their neck. Throbbing. But also, it's about Plagueis. Notice how she didn't say Yoda. Everybody knows she's not going to be able to get Yoda. But Plagueis, well, he will be the Plagueis on both their houses. Yes, the pun has to be said multiple times, all right? It's that good and bad simultaneously, like any good pun. Now, what we have seen from the Acolyte is a massive amount of campaigning and actually not that much from the fans. Yes, there was a new The Acolyte hashtag, but most of the campaigning has come from the cast themselves, the interviews, and they've been everywhere. And they're all Manager Kinto and Leslie Headland. All the rest of them, I know most of them are dead, but there are others which are alive, which are strangely missing, aren't they? Leslie Headland, Manager Kinto. Not Mandela Stenberg though. You know, the main character of the show. She's not been doing interviews that I've seen. I dropped a diss track. I dropped a diss track about it. <laughs> and I've looked, I've found everybody else's. And I think that shows that in this time where all these interviews are clearly being pitched at season two, telling you what you might get into the future, going, oh, isn't Manny hot? Everybody loves Manny. That things become noticeable by their absence. And they may have finally realized that ah, Amanda Stenberg, maybe we should just, you know, keep her off screen for a bit because every time she appears, she puts a foot in it. It's about more than just color. It's about black people, poor people, everybody at the bottom. Self-interest. There is this language of privilege and whiteness and wealth that had to observe and adapt to. <laughs> And all she did throughout the entire series is have a go at the fans, make diss tracks about the fans, go on TV and talk about the diss track that she made about the fans, and maybe, just maybe, deliberately antagonizing the fans isn't a way to get a season two. Maybe they've seen the reaction to season one and thought, maybe we should keep her behind closed doors. Instead, give the fans more of what they liked, manage your kinto. And maybe it's a sign that somebody, probably not Leslie, because I'm not sure she'd be that self-aware, but somebody has picked up on the idea that deliberately pissing off the people you want to watch your show, that's just not very smart, is it? Maybe we had words. Yeah, Amandla, I've got something to tell you. My dear, you should learn to be admired in silence. But those are just my thoughts. What are yours? Let me know down in the comments below. Like the video if you like the video. Subscribe. More videos like this in the future. And I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.